what we found is that the type of fiber really impacts not um, the different locations within the GI tract. So we saw that as we increased our total dietary fiber, we saw an increase in villi height in the duodenum as well as the ileum, but we saw it then drop off when we got to our extreme levels with that corn bran diet, um, kind of which we believe is probably indicating to us that we're overloading that gut's capacity to be able to um, handle these fibers. Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Hannah Miller, a PhD student at the University of Missouri. So Hannah, before we get started, would you mind giving the audience a brief introduction about yourself? Yes, of course. So thank you for having me here, Clayton. Uh, so my name is Hannah Miller. I am currently a PhD student at the University of Missouri. Um, I kind of travel around everywhere for my studies. I'm originally from the um, eastern half of Nebraska. I went down to Kansas State for my undergraduate degree, um, where before I got into swine, was exposed to a lot of production as well as research inter internships, um, which led me to the field of swine nutrition. Um, for my master's, I headed north um, to the tundra in South Dakota, where I completed my master's there under Dr. Levesque. Um, had a pretty applied master's while I was there, and I knew if I wanted to continue my education, um, wanted to look into something that maybe took a more basic science approach, which led me to Dr. Petrie, who at the time was at Texas Tech University. Um, I spent about eight months there at Texas Tech before um, Dr. Petrie accepted her job at the University of Missouri, and she said, Hannah, we got to pack our bags. We're headed back to the Midwest. So that's how I landed here at um, the zoo. Kevin calls all swine experts. You already know the key to a profitable swine operation is healthy, productive pigs. Our team of swine experts are driven by curiosity to create science-backed ingredients and solutions that help you maintain feed and water quality, improve intestinal health, optimize nutrition, and eliminate pathogens. Learn more today by diving in at chemin.com forward slash swine. Gotcha. So I see you've done a lot of research regarding fiber within different corn co-products, its digestibility, microbial shifts, etc., so I guess my first question is, what products did you all test and what variables did you really dial into um, to focus on into your studies? Yeah, so the overarching objective of this study was to look at how different corn co-products influences uh, the microbiome, digestibility, um, gastrointestinal tract within the pig, and that if we can understand how these corn co-products or how these co-products influence all of these different factors, we can then later develop technologies on how to improve fiber utilization in swine. Um, so in order to accomplish this, we fed these pigs seven diets. Um, the first one consisting of a controlled diet that was 70% cornstarch and practically devoid of fiber. Um, from there, we included six different corn co-products. So they included D-hole de degermed corn, corn gluten meal, ground corn, high protein DDGs, reduced oil or regular DDGs, and uh, corn bran. And this gave us a range of TDF values or total dietary values of less than 1% to about 12.5% on that high end with that corn bran diet. Gotcha. And with those different diets that you had and everything, what all did you really look at? Different digestibilities, performance metrics, et cetera, or what all did you dive into there? Yeah. So I, I guess our digestibility stuff is still in the works. Um, that's hopefully coming down the pipeline in the next couple of months of getting results on digestibility. Um, but what we do have is some really interesting data related to the histology of the animal as well as the microbiome. Um, so at the end of the study, 30 days, we necropsied these animals and we took histology sections um, at five different locations across the GI tract. So duodenum, jejunum, ileum, cecum, as well as the colon. And what we found is that the type of fiber really impacts not on um, the different locations within the GI tract. So we saw that as we increased our total dietary fiber, we saw an increase in villi height in the duodenum as well as the ileum, but we saw it then drop off when we got to our extreme levels with that corn bran diet, um, kind of which we believe is probably indicating to us that we're overloading that gut's capacity to be able to um, handle these fibers. Whereas in the large intestine, 
um, again, relating to our histology results, we see that as we increase that total dairy type fiber value, that we saw an increase in sequel crypt depth which inherently makes a lot of sense because that's where our fermentation is occurring is within the fiber. So as we increase um, fiber content, increasing that um, the cecum's ability to be able to handle those fibers. So you also mentioned some microbiome shifts and changes. So I guess when looking at um, different microbiomes of the pigs and different um, organs, what kind of shifts did you guys see? So right now we still have just preliminary results, but when we, we collected a fecal microbiome on day 0, 10, 20, and 30, and during this time, um, they, these pigs were originally just on a standard corn-soy diet, and we shifted them to these semi-synthetic diets that were mostly corn starch and then our corn co-product um, of interest. And we look at the shift from day 0 to day 10, we see that we essentially kind of crash the microbiome. Um, when we look at our chow one index, which is a measure of um, total different species numbers within that pre or bacteria present within that sample, we see that it dramatically drops. Um, each of these corn, co all of our diets were within that four to 500 range. But then when we look again at day 10, we see that there's a six fold increase within the microbiome seeing that, and we're assuming that it probably is stabilizing and adapting to these new diets. Um, and we see this increase in all of our diets with the exclusion of our control diet, which consisted just of cornstarch. So even the, our D whole D germ diet, which had just slightly above 1% fiber inclusion, we saw this six fold increase. So even just this small inclusion of fiber is helping to benefit the microbiome. And when we look again on um, from day 20 to day 30, we see that there's a stabilization within the microbiome. Um, and this also includes within our control diet. We see that control diet it eventually kind of catches up to everything else and it had a five-fold increase from day 20 to day 30. Um, but when we looked at it, the statistical significance between it, it was still had that chow one index was less than that of our corn co-product diets. If we wanted to dive into looking at individual um, different genuses, we see that um, with an increase in our total dietary fiber value, this is on our day 30 fecals, by the way, um, as we increase our TDF value, we see a decrease in our methanobrevibacter bacteria, um, which are known for producing um, methane gases in the process of digestion which is some really exciting news, um, as well as um, we looked at lactobacillus, that as we increase our total dietary fiber value within these diets, and again, in day 30 fecals, we see an increase in lactobacillus, uh, which are generally considered um, good gut bacteria and help to degrade these polysaccharides. Gotcha. And then what about short chain fatty acids? Did you look at any different SCFA productions based on these microbiome shifts? Yeah, uh, short chain fatty acids are tricky to quantify just because when they're in the gut, they're absorbed so quickly. And if you're measuring them in the fecal, you're measuring what is outputted, not what's absorbed. Um, but we do have preliminary da data looking at um, short chain fatty acid content within the gastrointestinal tract. Didn't see a profound difference um, within the ileum or in the colon. But within the cecum, we saw increases in propionate production and our three highest, um, our three highest corn co-product diets, so that high-protein DDGs, our regular DDGs in corn brand diet. Um, and we know that propionate can be used um, is, or is considered a modulator of good gut health. Gotcha. And I guess my final question for you is based on the results that you were explaining earlier, you saw with the addition of fiber that increased villus height. Um, which is usually indicative of an increased digestibility, but being fiber, it typically tends to reduce digestibility. So with those kind of conflicting results, I know you don't have the digestibility part done yet, but what would you expect to see from those results or how do you, could you really explain that um, kind of contrasting results there? Yeah, and that's really kind of the driver behind this entire study is we know there's this conflicting paradigm that we see when we include fibers, a benefit to the microbiome. Um, we see benefit within histolo histology and increases in surface area, which should be indicative of improvement of absorption and digestibility. Um, but it's been well established that including fiber within the diet 
decreases digestibility. And really that's the driver of what we're trying to answer here is if we understand all of these key components, how can we then apply future technologies to improve fiber utilization? Gotcha. Well, I believe that's all the time we have. So thank you again, Hannah, for coming on the show and sharing all this with us. Thank you for having me. Yep. And everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week.